Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's really wonderful to uh, once again come back to Linz. Okay, better. Um, so I'd like to present again um, Choke Point Project, which if some of you saw this last year, then I will give you a little bit of an update what's happened with the project since then. Otherwise, um, bear with me. Others, most of you probably have, don't know about the project. Um, so, without ado, um, we're rehashing what our last um, project just presented, but essentially a lot of people were very touched and wanted to do something when the internet was turned off most dramatically in Egypt last year in January. And we've seen already many examples of um, incidents in both Western lands and all over the world where governments have been restricting access. So our response, or me and a friend, was to do something a little different that was more focusing on um, how can we know about this in advance, or how can we um, be able to um, see what's going on in the network. Um, of course, we have this fellow who, in our Western countries, decided, oh, Egypt, you have one of those. Can we have one as well? Um, so Choke Point is really focusing on monitoring um, and dis detecting surveillance being an early warning project. And um, what we do is we essentially um, collect data from across the network layer. Um, last year, we were busy with also um, hosting workshops to teach people to understand uh, what's, how the internet actually works. Um, anyway, let me give you some of the project background. So last year, using uh, Ars Electronica funding, we went to this amazing place in Germany called uh, the Chaos Communication Camp. They run it every five years. And um, I'm not a technologist or like a programmer myself, so we invited some people who we recruited. And we went there to um, try to come up with the, uh, how are we going to do this? How do we measure the internet and detect surveillance? So um, we went to this really weird environment where there were racks connecting people to, in toilets, strange radio telescopes which were bouncing signals off the moon, which is a pre-satellite technology to send signals, and um, MIG jets hanging around. Um, but we actually did get to the important point, which was meeting the important people who know how to do um, measuring and monitoring and understanding technology. We organized a village there called the Blackout Technology Village, Resilient Technologies Village. And this was actually the outcome, a little drawing, which um, kind of looks lame, but actually it's quite important. Um, that represents a country, and if you look at um, B or A, that could be a village or a city. And essentially the big problem was how can we know, how can we localize exactly what's happening in an area and know when, for instance, something's happened in a, a city or a village and be sure about that. Um, so, um, we met a whole bunch of folk from different organizations there, and, um, and at the same time, the United Nations released this declaration that um, it's a human right to have access to the internet. So, from that drawing and, uh, and thinking together, we started thinking, well, you know, who might such a technology be useful to? So, for journalists who have activists in countries where it's dangerous to communicate, um, they would be able to help know if they'd lost contact, if they knew techno uh, communications were down in a specific location. At the same time, um, when people are migrating or being, there's, there's the situation such as in Syria, where people are crossing borders and there's, um, they can't contact other family members, then it's good to know why you can't reach them if it's a telecommunications issue. At the same time, uh, when you have large earthquakes, te uh, technology or hardware goes down, so you might be able to detect um, an earthquake um, and see the epicenter far faster, like in China. They were only able to see the epicenter of the earthquake, not the outlying villages, and save lots of lives. And um, more increasingly, as um, after Egypt, governments are desperate to have some kind of situational awareness of cyber geography to understand what's happening on the ground um, and uh, what's, what, where, um, where have signals gone down, can we predict um, exactly where that might happen again. 
and academics who are asking deep research questions able to look at the data and um, do their research. So here are a few of the things that we're trying to measure. Power outages. Um, at this point, not, but cell tower and um, copper wire phone networks. Radio frequency jamming. As you can see, this is um, China has for a long time um, been blocking Falun Gong uh, broadcasts by playing military music over it. Very beautiful. Um, bandwidth throttling, a restriction. Um, port and protocol blocking. Source and destination IP blocking. I know this sounds a little bit technical to some, most of you, so. Um, and then, of course, attacks, like taking boxes out of rooms. Um, website defacements and DDoS attacks. Um, large amounts of um, computers that have been taken over that um, send packets and overwhelm a server. Um, so we then took that and we kind of came up with a visual language. And we um, wanted to kind of create this um, overview of the world. And our kind of vision is it's going to be a little bit like Wikipedia um, in the sense of having information, but also live, near real time. We would like people to be able to look at their country and get alerts, um, be able to know what's happening. So um, each country has a page, and there's some sort of feed that um, relates to different kinds of um, data sets that we collect. And, um, so you can see you can turn off uh, networks and turn off uh, different layers on, on a map. But also, uh, this could be downloaded. And also, you could just receive notifications through email. Um, so we actually went and built a prototype in November. And this, is, this was based on um, non-live data. This used the Google Transparency Report data, which reports stuff that Google was asked to take down legally, whether it's a prostitution site or whether it's just an unknown site that they just said, this is being shut down. And also, this connectivity status, we were looking at this uh, Google data set, the measurement lab, and they measure uh, traffic shaping, which is if you're downloading files, uh, perhaps videos, um, they, some countries or ISPs reduce your bandwidth. And so they try to measure for that. But we basically did a very, a very simple, um, where we removed some of the data. We took a little chunk of it. We removed some of it and put it into this, hack, this, this um, early prototype. The actual data file is 500 terabytes. So um, we are now processing that. And we are about to release the disconnection state map, which is trying to, this is like after a year, we've got down to much more specifically, how can we measure the state of a region? And hopefully this is, I think it's gonna be um, near real time, and we should be releasing this soon. Um, I won't go into the technical details of this. Um, at the same time, we've been building partnerships with many journalistic organizations, and it's very important to verify events on the network with contextual information from stuff that uh, journalists or people that they know um, report events to them. So you can then correlate events. And the more data sets you have, the more interesting and um, richer picture you get of what's happening. So 2012, um, continuing the what's been happening with uh, governments uh, restricting networks. Um, it's just been uh, crazy. Uh, and this is actually a site wh which was um, created to find all the companies behind software sold to usually um, get rid of child um, pornography and uh, terrorism, but increasingly is used to police uh, our own populations in, in democratic countries. So WikiLeaks and its friends uh, released this very nice um, list of all the countries and which kind of software they're selling. 
Um, and recently, there's this organization that's part of the United Nations that's interested in um, also regulating the internet. And it is a little bit unknown exactly where this is leading, so I will cut them some slack um, at the moment. But there is mentioned that they also want to ban cryptography. So um, following the theme of everyday rebels, um, I will show you um, some tools that people use, activists on the ground, that are used to um, hide their communication. And a few things you can do if you're in the monitoring um, area where we are. Um, so it's very simple, but uh, recently in Australia, um, there was uh, talk of, again, uh, data retention keeping everything that's uh, that is passed through the internet um, for a longer period of time. And someone on Twitter commented, we should host a cryptography party. And essentially, that caught on. And as people have decided to start hosting parties where you can learn about how to make your communications private. Um, so you can go to their website, and you can find one in your city and be guided by um, people that know exactly what's, how, how you can do this. Um, so this is um, an email of mine that's been encrypted. Um, the tools, if I'm honest, are really, I don't find them simple and easy to use. They're still a little bit geeky. Um, but essentially, uh, you both have a key. And so if, if the other person does not have um, this key that basically unlocks the email, then the email looks like this. So this is what an email would look like to someone who doesn't have this, this other side to unlock it. There's Tor. You can download uh, Tor, which allows you to anonymously browse. Um, and there's organizations that help give you toolkits where you can just you know, learn it all in, in one package. On the monitoring side, there's groups that do crowdsourcing. So you can, with Herdict, you can basically get a list of which important websites in your country, like YouTube, Google, if, if those are not banned. And you just can test a bunch of these websites. And that's sent back to them. And so they're kind of on the other side. We're doing kind of scientific, verifiable tests on the network layer. They're doing crowdsourced kind of people reporting which websites are blocked so they can kind of nicely work together. And there's more geeky options like Uniprobe, which essentially is for programmers. Um, you basically do the same thing, but on a, in a scientific level as Herdict. You have lists of sites, and you, check, you can check them to see if they're doing weird stuff. And um, that's, that creates reports. And another wonderful um, article I would recommend a lot is going to check out uh, Cory Doctorow's latest uh, keynote speech in the Cass Computer Club, but also he uh, recently gave another talk. And this is a little bit um, more abstract, but very well worth uh, watching. So um, I'd like to end and uh, say thank you very much. <laughs>